so welcome everyone <clears throat> let's start so if anyone could read the opening aspiration for us all of us and maybe all of us inwardly can hear it out and say it inwardly anyone who would like to do that yeah i'll read okay please with boundless compassion and wisdom i will work for the welfare of all may we be free from hunger and discord and have joy and a world at peace thank you um so today uh, i have a teaching short teaching from jit sunma but maybe i'll uh, share it uh, in a while while i think first we go through a few lines few par paragraphs in the book and then we'll share the teaching listen to the teaching so just jumping over to where we last left on the introduction yeah so we uh, i think we have to start from page number 4 uh, the last paragraph yeah so uh, would anyone want to go ahead read it out for us i can read yes please can you hear me yes okay. please yeah. i received a commentary on this text from the 16th gyalwang karmapa and also a short explanation by the 14th dalai lama himself i also received teachings on this text from dilgo khense rinpoche and i will be drawing on this on his commentary throughout this book most of the verses are fairly self explanatory but it is always helpful to receive teachings on them to deepen our understanding should i go on monica yes please please yeah okay to complement our discussion of thongme and sangpo's text i shall refer to another lojong text eight verses for training the mind by langri thangpa a revered kadampa master and a shining light in the lojong tradition i shall intersperse the discussion of this text with commentary on the 37 verses on the practice of a bodhisattva when the themes of the two texts closely overlap this way we will get a deeper understanding of the lojong tradition and a clearer sense of how to apply the teachings in our daily life each chapter of this book opens with a verse from the 37 verses on the practice of a bodhisattva the text we rely on here was translated from the tib from the tibetan by the padmakara translation group and previously published in the heart of compassion the 37 verses on the practice of a bodhisattva by dilgo khense rinpoche as in most traditional texts the 37 verses on the practice of a bodhisattva starts with the invocation explaining for whom the text was composed thogme sangpo starts by saying namo lokeshwaraya lokeshwaraya means lord of the worlds which is another name for avalokiteshwar also known as chen rezik or kuan yin avalokiteshwar is the bodhisattva of compassion who is an appropriate object of obeisance for a text dealing with the bodhisattva's way of compassion while texts dealing with philosophy logic and so forth invoke manjushri the bodhisattva of wisdom texts that deal with the heart and how to incorporate compassion into our daily lives 
invoke Av Avalokiteshvara. The text reads, Though he sees that in all phenomena there is no coming and going, he strives solely for the sake of being. Phenomena here is translated from the word dharmas, meaning ordinary things, just outer things. As we all know, in Buddhism, there is a great emphasis on impermanence and the momentary nature of all outer and inner phenomena on the fact that everything arises and disappears each moment like a flowing river. It looks like the same river, but moment to moment, the water is changing, moving, swirling, and flowing ever drowned stream. Everything is like that. Everything comes into being and disappears again instantaneously. Although in our perception, it looks like there is a continuity. Yes, thank you, Shilpi. So we'll maybe take this up for reflection. Any thoughts, anyone? So I think this is, uh, in Buddhism, this is the crux of the matter, which really saves us uh, from a lot of, one can say, suffering, because we, the cause of our suffering, if we look at our own lives, is that we become too grasping at my ideas about life, and this is how this other person should behave, you know, this is how my life should go on. So we have fixed ideas and fixed dogmas in our mind, fixed images in our mind. And uh, when things do not happen according to them, then we suffer. So here it is said that uh, when we see the true nature of whatever arises, whatever can be seen, like thoughts and feelings can be seen, people can be seen, things can be seen. So anything that can be sensed or seen, is temporary it's like fleeting you know it comes and goes uh, many a times anger is there but then anger is not there you know it comes and it goes but when we stick too tightly to our uh, impermanent thoughts or feelings or dogmas or ideas or opinions or images in the head about myself and the others opinions about world about myself or the others they also keep on changing you know because right now the opinion of the world that i may have i did not have that uh, a few years ago so and right now whatever is there that will also evolve and change into something you know different so then there is no point when we look at this basic impermanence of things and that they arise from emptiness and they dis disappear back into that emptiness again then we don't give that much of importance to them because if we give too much uh, you know if we hold too tightly to all these impermanent things then it naturally inevitably brings us suffering because when things do not happen according to my way, then we suffer because I have a fixed image in the mind. You know, or when we hold on to our thoughts and feelings as very, very tight, you know, like this is what I am feeling and this is what is right. Rest everything is wrong, you know, something like that. So then we suffer, then we have wars. That's why, you know, from time to time, cold wars and other kind of wars happen because both the parties are sticking very rigidly to their ideas about peace, freedom, whatever. You know. And nobody is ready to change. So there's hardly any understanding that can be find, found there. And this is one of the tools that Buddhism gives us to when we see the true nature of all the things, including thoughts, feelings, people in our life, you know, our life situations, 
we begin to realize that they keep on changing they are impermanent you know and they they disappear into emptiness and then arise from emptiness so they are you know they are not as solid as they appear to be so then uh, when i know it you know and slowly slowly practically realize it see it for myself then i can take things less seriously you know like don't kill myself for that or any any other person for that So seeing true nature of thoughts and feelings is one of the tools that they give us through Buddhism, Buddhist practice that it can relax us you know, when we see the true nature, that it's not as solid as it appears to be. Yeah, anything anyone wants to share or add on? So uh, one thing, Monica, this uh, realization that about the impermanence of things, that they are coming and going, this is also very fleeting, actually, for myself, if I speak from experience, this also doesn't stay, like I keep forgetting or, you know, sometimes I'm reminded, sometimes I'm not. So it does one take this kind of wisdom it looks like wisdom also to be of the same nature as the rest of the scene or perceived things yeah you know i think that's why practice is considered so important that's why effort in on this path is considered so important because the default is that we forget default is that we get only fleeting glimpses of uh, this realization true realization that yes it is impermanent and I can't grasp onto anything. But then again, the grasping mind comes back when we are non-vigilant. So that's why the fleeting glimpse is there. But even when we have, uh, only for once we have tasted that glimpse, the idea is to continue to come back to it because in our understanding, in our intelligence, we see that rest all is just a cause of misery. Grasping is a cause of misery. So again and again, for my sake and for others sake and for their wellness and for my wellness i keep on coming back to this realization from which i keep slipping i think that's why kabir says that my you know my house is at the top of this little peak you know like a very sharp peak and the road is so slippery that even a an ant cannot uh, place its foot there so how are you imagining with lots of burden on your mind you will travel this path it's so slippery. So slippery is referring to this forgetfulness that we slip back into our patterns, grasping patterns. So this is a age old problem. <laughs> and that's why again and again, avatars have to come, masters have to come, remind us, remind us. Many Kabirs have to come, Guru Nanak has to come, you know, all the others have to come and remind, continue reminding. That's why we are again and again having such kind of reflections so that we continue to remind ourselves that whenever the grasping strikes, there would be more chances that I am not taken over by grasping. Because we forget, we are born in forgetfulness. No? Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything? So there was a beautiful teaching by Jitsunma, which I thought I'll share with you. And it's almost on the lines of what Shilpi was sharing. Uh, so let me just, maybe it's the right moment. Maybe let's, uh, let's hear it now and then we can continue with the rest of the thing. So I'll... Uh, Actually, I would like to just play the audio because then we can maybe just listen attentively. And uh, don't bother if you miss something because there is a lot which we will, uh, you know, absorb. 
so even if you miss something it's it's okay and later on i'll share the transcript of this part which we are hearing on the group also so i'm sharing the uh, computer audio only and it starts with a half of a sentence so again not to bother about that but then things will become clearer she is that things are not going to go the way i want them to go and you know so that a lot of people are so anxious, not about anything which is actually in the present moment, but about what could happen mm. in the next moment. And so this, this desire for becoming is also a cause of great anxiety and fear and worry. Mm. So the, you know, someone on the path of, of letting go, let's go of everything. Let's go of, of the desire to become and the desire for not becoming also, both. Just be without needing to um, solidify and reify that. So does that also just somewhat relate to, uh, because if, if we'd gotten to the end of the teaching, um, I think Joseph uh, went on to, because I was listening to it earlier today and I was really thinking about, um, he described, you know, our engagement in activities with the mindset of doing it to be finished with it, even if it's something really lovely, but you're still, you're kind of, you're engaged with it, but you, you're, you're wanting it to be over, in, you know, that you're, you're so busy getting through it, anticipating, planning, etc. so that I mean, I just became very aware of, or more aware of how much I do that. And it can be really nice things, really wonderful things, but I'm already wanting it to be finished because I'm so busy planning the next planning thing. The next thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's how people live, isn't it? It's terrible. You know, I, they're caught up in the past and regurgitating the past, especially bad things which happened in the past. Um, the ego is quite, you know, enjoys, you know, thinking over all the awful things which have ever happened to it and blaming them themselves in the present for what happened in the past but at the same time also projecting the future moment to moment again yes we are not it is very fascinating that the one place we cannot be is now and we are always either caught up in comparisons with the past or in anticipations or worries about the future even as, as Aileen is saying, even when it's something pleasant, really nice happening, still there is that grasping at what will come next and how to deal with what's going to come next. I mean, this is because, this is because the ego, the sense of I cannot live nakedly in the present. This is why awareness is the path to liberation. Because awareness is only in the present moment. And if we are really aware without commenting, but just knowing in that state of pure knowing, there's no ego because the ego cannot live now. It lives in the past, it lives in the future. If we are present, it comments on it the whole time and judges it and compares it. It cannot just live nakedly with no covering and that's why it's so difficult to stay in the present it sounds like very easy but it isn't because for the ego it's death yeah and so it's very fearful that we might actually start to enjoy just being instead of endlessly becoming so this is why you know always 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 in all buddhist schools the emphasis is on learning how to become more mindful, more aware, more, more present, more knowing, being here. I mean, that, that's why all Buddhist schools, that's the crux of it. And the Buddha said, mindfulness is the one path to liberation. And why it's so difficult? Because on one level, it's so easy. All we have to do is, is be present and know we're present. Um, why is that that next moment the mind is lost again? 
And it's why we need to do a little bit of formal meditation to begin to habituate the mind to staying with what is happening instead of running off in all directions. But the beauty of it is, is that we, we can all do it. It just takes practice. But it, it's not something, you know, incredibly esoteric or, you know, um, you know, impossible. Anybody can do it. But we forget. You know, the word for mindfulness in, in, in Tibetan and in, in Sanskrit is the word to remember. It literally means to remember. And so therefore it's direct, it's direct opponent is that we forget, we forget to remember. What are we trying to remember? We're trying to remember what is happening in the moment. And so we get lost. Mm. But good news is that we find ourselves again. And as soon as we realize we're lost, we're no longer lost. So I hope that was clear and audible. Yeah. So that's why I think uh, it, it was relating very well with what you were sharing that uh, the mind just slips going to past habits. Uh, bad patterns, it slips back into the either present commentary, you know, past or future worries or past ruminations. We all of us, I think all of us know the taste of it. And that's why effort is required because we have to bring with effort the mind to the present moment, either to the breath in the body or, you know, just being aware of being aware. And that's how we have to develop a new habit of the mind that it begins to stay in the present moment and not run around and jump around all the time, which is its old habit. Because of it, it suffers. So that's why. Yeah. So let's uh, continue. If there is any question or reflection, feel free to share at any time. So uh, maybe taking from since impermanence is a fundamental axiom. Anyone who would like to read? Yeah, I'll start. Since impermanence is a fundamental axiom of Buddhist thought, we might ask why the text says, he sees certain phenomena, there is no coming and going. Here it is a dealing with ultimate reality. In our ordinary relative way of seeing, things come and they go. Things are up, they are down. Things last for a long time or they disappear swiftly. But in ultimate reality, all these dualities no longer pertain. There is no coming and going. There is no higher and lower. There is no annihilation or endless existence. All these opposites, all these dualities are transcended in a state of how things truly are. Although Avalokiteshvara is the Bodhisattva who represents compassion, his compassion naturally arises from the point of view of his perfect wisdom. Yeah, thank you, Ritu. So as we were discussing and was being shared in the earlier one also that owing to our continued practice, we slowly realize and not only mentally realize, but also practically realize the true nature of things, which is empty bubble like nature and that there is no need to grasp at things because there's nothing there. And because of that only suffering can end. Otherwise our suffering cannot end because the moment we grasp 
with grasping the suffering starts so when one sees this true nature of ultimate reality then uh, he see he sees that in phenomena anything which is limited by time and space it starts and it ends that's phenomena you know that's how they define phenomena anything which is limited in time and space so people thoughts feelings all of it you know uh, that we can see sense perceive it's all limited in time and space it arises it disappears it arises it disappears you know and even feelings for example you know i was that day i was uh, some other day i was reading a note by somebody uh, which was sent on birthday and when i was reading that note you know one part of me was really joyful to read at it you know look at it but then suddenly there was this realization that this too will change you know the feeling that i have right now uh, on reading this these lines written you know uh, which i am taking so much delight in it will change because that's how i have seen in the past you know in the past also there have been cards that i have read you know and i have very fondly cherished in that moment i have cherished those cards but now i don't even look at it you know so i see that my feelings keep on changing so immediately what happens through this uh, understanding or even if it's a mental understanding that our grasping cannot be there so we can enjoy the message you know we can enjoy whatever is going on but then i would not be able to grasp because uh, there is a futility in grasping because i see that you know it's like really it nothing lasts so this feeling also right now which i'm having which appears so precious it's not going to last you know and i don't have to cling to that feeling going to that because when we cling to feelings or any you know any other things uh, we we continue to suffer and the other person also suffers so when we see that in phenomena there is no coming and going that there is actually all this is you know kind of a play of maya it's not coming and going it's just uh, empty awareness and when also jatsunma many a times describes in other places also that when we say it it arises from emptiness and dissolves in emptiness that emptiness is not a dull emptiness like it's nothing there it's full of infinite potential and true qualities like love intelligence kindness compassion oneness unity you know understanding so that emptiness is a clear luminous emptiness it's not like empty mean it's nothing is there it's full of immense potential so there is a difference when many people you know relate this with nihilistic thought that see this is saying that there is nothing there you know it all anything doesn't exist but that's not what it want wants to say it wants to say that there is nothing that we can grasp on to to latch on to and as we have shared in many other sessions also that even quantum physics now is proving you know that's what quantum physics is about that there is nothing solid wherever we are seeing that oh there is something solid so when we try to grasp at what appears solid because of our limited senses Uh, it's just a distortion you know and i don't have to stick to that distortion so in our ordinary relative way of seeing things come and they go things are up they are down things last for a long time or they disappear swiftly but in ultimate reality all these dualities no longer pertain so when the ultimate reality is realized that which is the true nature of all the things is realized then uh, there is no duality there there is no good and bad there and uh, i think in one of the songs kabir also says that hamare desh mein nahi chanda nahi suraj na hi koi dharti na hi koi you know uh, gagana so there he talks about this end of dualities that there is no duality there there is no coming and going there is no higher and lower there is no annihilation or endless existence so all these opposites are not there all these opposites all these dualities are transcended in that in a state of 
how things truly are and that's what we usually call as you know realizing oneself or uh, achieving you know full enlightenment that we become stabilized in that state of pure knowing and not only just mentally talk about it but our life becomes a living example of that and that's what our, our path is all about you know otherwise we will all be really enlightened beings by now but the path is long because we continue to slip we continue to get back to the ego which is grasping 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 and then we have to again put effort and you know uh, by that bring the mind to the present and let go of the grasping and again move on so this will happen infinite number of times ultimately you know, uh, stabilizing ourselves in that state that there is no more stabilizing required it's our effortless nature And that's why mother says that perseverance is so important because it's a very long journey. Ego doesn't die so easily. Ego means our grasping, clingy, sticky self. So we don't even realize and it's sticking. That's the blindness. We think that, oh, but I have dissolved my ego. <laughs> you know, that itself is the sticking. See, I have uh, you know, realized myself. Yeah, and the more closer as in prayers and meditations, mother shares that the more closer I go to the divine, the more you escape me because, you know, you continue to go on and on and on and on and on beyond and beyond and beyond. There is no end to this beyond because if there is end to the beyond, then it's, it cannot be called beyond. You know? And when we say divine is infinite, that the ultimate reality is infinite. You know, then uh, we cannot reach one day that we say that, oh, I have reached the infinite because it's not limited. You know? So it's a long, 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 long journey for all of us. Yeah, anything anyone wants to add on here? So shall we move ahead then if no reflection yeah. Thank you. would anyone want to read from images of avalokiteshvara <clears throat> i'll read images of avalokiteshvara show him with thousand arms which represent his endless compassionate activities on behalf of all beings. In each of the thousand hands, there is an eye, which symbolizes that he sees the situation accurately from both ordinary and transcendental levels. Avalokiteshvara knows how to act or how not to act, because sometimes it is better to leave matters alone, even though we would like to change them. Avalokiteshvara sees things with the total clarity of an enlightened mind. Therefore, he sees that on an ultimate level, there is no coming and going, that all dharmas are in a state of suchness, which is beyond the temporal idea of the constant flow of phenomena. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, anything anyone wants to add on? I think this line is very beautiful uh, because sometimes it is better to leave matters alone even though we would like to change them. Really, very practical suggestion. Anyone wants to share anything here?
Yes, if you could delve a little bit more into this. I mean, this is a line that caught my eye also the maximum. It's better to leave matters alone, even though we'd like to change them. And this is all that we aspire to do all the time. So, mm. Yeah. Would anyone want to add on onto this line? Any reflection on this line? I think one thing which is coming to me is that uh, mother also gives this suggestion uh, in many cases that since we don't see things truly, we are only looking at like you know a bit of it and that bit is nothing in front of the total picture. We don't know the total picture. So whatever action we will take with our limited mind, it will be an action in ignorance. And most of the times when our attention is focused on outside matters and where we are trying to, with the limited logical analytical mind, you know, work out the best way possible. That may be a relative best way, but it never is the, it never is the best, best, best way, you know, because uh, the best way we can't know by our limited mind. And as Mother and Shorobindo talk about that the best way can only be known or seen. Uh, when the mind becomes absolutely silent, quiet and calm. But then we get the direction to to the right action or the right word to be spoken. Yeah. So that's why in most of the cases, since we act in our restlessness and aggression and we think that I know the way, whatever I think is the best way. So that's never the best way because we don't know the larger picture, bigger picture. And to know the best way uh, is to first quieten down the mind and to receive the intuitive guidance, which itself is a sadhana process, you know, so it's not that suddenly in one moment, if I want to know the best way, I'll be able to do that. Uh, it won't come like that. It's a matter of continued sadhana and practice to get in tune with that calm, still state of mind in which you can receive the guidance, whether something is to be done or not to be done. So most of the times we see that in many, many cases, when we act according to our limited intelligence, that's all we have usually in our restlessness, uh, we many a times uh, spoil the matters because we can't see the true picture, the larger picture. Yeah, and when we are letting things be and maybe waiting for a guidance uh, in our quiet still mind you know that maybe something some action needs to be taken uh, outside many a times you know, uh, in a state of urgency then when we mother says that if we quieten down the mind and if we have calm in the being then we can best know what is to be done and which itself is uh, cannot have we cannot have it like a click that will again you know, suddenly quieten down the mind when we are not habituated to do it. So that's why the practice had to con has to continue in the good days also. Uh, when the days are good, you know, and things are running smoothly, then to cultivate, continue to cultivate this practice of keeping the mind simple and quiet and tuned uh, to the higher guidance. So that in the moments of emergency or in moments which are so called crucial, again, you know, so take it with a pinch of salt, so-called crucial, there we can have a clarity of mind also. So that's what I feel, but of course, you know, there is more to this. And also as mother shares that we always have biases we always always have biases either we have a mental bias we have a emotional bias some bias is there so we can't ever be sure that i am now working operating without a bias and when i have this filter of a bias in front of me it's like a curtain it prevents me for from seeing the true situation you know? So when I am humble enough, I'm grounded enough, then I can actually tell myself that 
I, I, I can't be sure because I know that I have a bias. So, you know, you turn to something higher and ask that, please guide. I don't know. I see that I have a bias. So to be able to see the bias itself is, I think, a beautiful step ahead. Not that we are rid of the bias, but at least we are ready to step back from it. Because when I want to change the things in certain, certain way, which I think is the best way possible, how am I sure? I can't be sure. So, you know, not giving my thoughts, my opinions, my ideas about a situation too much of importance because I can't be sure. You know, there are more things at work. I can't be sure. So this really grounds uh, us a lot. Just telling yourself that I don't know. And I would share something really, you know, which is coming to me here. You know, I wanted to work uh, with just a thought is coming again and again that I want to work with prisons, you know, maybe work with prisoners. So I was talking to someone and uh, she was sharing that the first thing when, you know, uh, you get some kind of a training in here and there outside, uh, they tell you is it at many places, the first thing they tell you is to go in the prison and maybe meet the inmates or whoever you are meeting with an idea that I don't know. So it's not that I know and I know how to fix this situation. I know what they are going through and I will fix it all up. You know, if we go with that, then we are bound to you know, maybe suffer more yeah, than the prisoners. Maybe we are all prisoners of our mind. But then, you know, she was sharing that just know that you do not know. And be grounded in that knowing that I don't know what is the best way here and then in that the mind stills down the silence comes and there we have the intuitive guidance you know so whatever word needs to be spoken action needs to be done that can come forward when i say that i don't know because i know is a function of ego consciousness and that i know is very limited and that why that is why people that are at war with each other all the time, you know, like I know and I know. So we are at, you know, and my I know is different from your I know. So we are at, always at war with each other. Yeah. Any addition, anyone? Okay, so if no reflection, let's go ahead. Uh, if anyone would like to read this, page 7, the first line of Thaukme Sampo's. Anyone feels ready? The first line of Thaukme Sampo's text raises Avlokteshwara's wisdom. The second line relates to compassion. Avlokteshwara sees the transcendent, the ultimate, while constantly striving for the sake of others on a relative level with compassion. It is important that wisdom and compassion come together if we don't see things clearly or fully understand the situation, we can mess things up. Avlokteshwara sees things vastly and just how they truly are. From that infinite perspective, he is able to spontaneously act in a way that is of ultimate and relative benefit for beings. By combining ultimate and relative truth, he is also the sublime teacher, meaning 
our root guru you could think of his holiness the dalai lama or the gyalvong karam karamapa gyalvong gyalvong karmapa karmapa gyalvong karmapa both of whom are considered to be emanations of avlokateshvara to the sublime teacher inseparable from avlokateshvara the protector of beings i pay constant homage with respectful body speech and mind in buddhism we have the three doors body speech and mind we pay homage to the teacher with these three why simply because our teacher is inseparable from avlokateshvara dilgo khense rinpoche said in the heart of compassion his own commentary on the 37 verses on the practice of bodhisattva the sublime spiritual master is inseparable from avlokateshvara the embodiment of the compassion of all the buddhas although he manifests in infinite ways for the sake of being and displays countless different forms avlokateshvara's nature never changes fully enlightened he has actualized primordial wisdom his mind is the non dual unchanging enlightened mind of all the buddhas the absolute absolute dharmakaya thank you yeah anything anyone wants to share just at the rate of uh, compassion and kind of tying it to the line that we read in the last paragraph where it said that sometimes to know not to do anything you know not to intervene is also an act of compassion i think you know i can visualize say a child in that right like when a child is learning you know how to do different things learning say learning to walk and all it's much easier to just pick him up right because you see he's falling again and he's stumbling and stuff and yet because you know the greater good you let the situation be right if you can give some assistance from the side you may you might keep a carpet that if he falls maybe it hurts less but unless you allow him to walk or make his own mistakes he would not learn right like and especially when they go bigger also right like they are doing something which they think is very smart and yet you know you know but that lesson is important to be learned so a lot of times i believe we could try to complete things for others right because it just feels that okay probably he can't see it let me tell him but then that backfires you know it happens at times because the other is not ready he has to go through that falling and rising and getting up himself and realizing himself so just that one should not feel you know like kind of that i was doing something good and still you know things that were not taken in the right spirit and stuff because one has to respect like i make my mistakes and i learn from them similarly that's also an act of compassion that when you're seeing somebody in the wrong and yet when you can see that that wrong will lead to right right will lead to growth evolution and stuff so that's also so much compassion to let them be and not intervene or comment or judge yeah
I think in parallelly you also uh, shared something on the wisdom one should have in order to be truly compassionate you know, because if I have seen in my life that how without faltering and without really getting bruised and you know all of that is necessary mandate for progress if I have whatever little relative degree of wisdom through my experiences then you know, uh, one can be in that wisdom truly truly compassionate and the true compassion what you were sharing that letting the process happen and there is this famous story I think all of us may have heard where this little child or I don't know maybe an adult who is uh, watching this uh, caterpillar go into this cocoon and he's out of compassion you know he's wondering that oh you know it's it would be so troublesome for him to go out come out of this cocoon so let me just break this cocoon for him but the moment he breaks the cocoon he realizes that the uh, caterpillar could not have wings because of you know he could not have the time to push the cocoon which gives rise to the strength to have wings and you know the further growth so uh, we have plenty of such examples in nature also yeah very important and in the name of compassion especially with our children i think not only with our children but specific specifically with our loved ones and children most of the times i think we are making them weaker only uh, not even knowing that we are uh, doing that hmm. And we don't even, you know, like that, I think we also stop uh, responsibility to come into the room. Because uh, when I have the freedom to commit mistakes and grow through the mistakes, then uh, I become also responsible for myself. But we see that nowadays, specifically this age group that we call as uh, teenage or, you know, uh, young adults specifically not only that of course it is all spread out there we see lack of responsibility because we do not give in such a cocooned atmosphere we do not give the chance to make mistakes and learn from them you know we are always trying to cover up cover up cover up and yeah one doesn't learn how to be responsible for oneself And also this uh, prison example that I was sharing that, you know, many a times there is only the only thing that is required, uh, if required, <laughs> now that you are there, you know, is just your, uh, like a truly genuine, authentic presence with the other person. I think that itself has in most of the situations, whether it's a, you know, physical presence or just a presence. Uh, most of the times that itself has such a powerful healing effect that uh, so-called words of wisdom or advice or suggestion may not have even one may do a workshop but if one touches a being which that with that full authentic genuine presence that the other person is not trying to fix you or change you you know completely with you especially you know also reflecting on the case of where one is sitting uh, with a person and maybe the automatic response is that oh let me fix this situation let me fix him you know many a times we approach the situation with this that let me you know uh, fix or control this person or situation but whenever we go and approach the situation in such a way, it's always mostly a blunder, you know, sooner or later we realize. But when we just are in that knowing and wisdom, we are grounded, you know, that I really don't know the larger picture. 
so whatever i will say will be limited and you know, not really the best so in that understanding if we are grounded i think then the heart really opens and there is true compassion same with our children same with our loved ones non loved ones you know with our own self actually you know that maybe i am going through something and i have no clue how to go about it and in knowing that yes i don't have a clue but i am with myself you know then true healing presence i feel uh, that can be have so from that infinite perspective our lokiteshwara is able to spontaneously act in a way that is of ultimate and relative benefit for beings and i think uh, not only uh, avalokiteshwara because we are all genuinely avalokiteshwara you know we all have the wisdom of avalokiteshwara so there are times which i am sure we all of us can recollect where spontaneously some guidance has come you have not analyzed it calculated it it's not come through the logical analytical mind it has just been received and through that intuitive guidance whenever one acts it's also of ultimate benefit and relative benefit for you know whoever that action was taken i think we will if we look back at our lives we will have enough uh, glimpses of this intuitive spontaneous act or word of speech or something yeah so this is what we have to purify body speech and mind i think in integral yoga also we talk about uh, the harmonization of all the instruments the mental the vital the physical around the psychic center which is pure and devoted uh, to the light and truth so here also you know the three doors body sense perception speech and mind all of them centered Uh, around the internal wisdom so i'm not uh, going to take up these uh, very specific words of buddhism like dharma kaya and others may come but we'll focus on maybe the crux of the matter because then we just get too confused so um yeah there is still one more page left uh, if we want we can also take it up today or if we wish to finish right now then also it's okay whatever you suggest yeah we can take it up now if everybody is okay okay great so if those of us who want to leave uh, maybe they can leave and those of us who want to stay for this this much they can stay okay so anyone who would like to go ahead uh, this one the buddha and the bodhisattvas yeah i'll go ahead yes please the buddhas and the bodhisattvas are not separate from our teachers nor from us they are a true nature who we really are if only we could see clearly we think we are ordinary sentient beings but we are not this is our tragedy but the teacher a genuine realized being or lama 
is not inherently different from us. And so in Buddhist meditations, we absorb either the deity or the Lama or both together into ourselves, thinking that our minds and their minds are mixed together like water with water so that we recognize that there is no distinction. The distinction comes from our side. We think we are ordinary and they are special, but that's part of our delusion. And so we have to work away at that conceptual distinction, cleaning and polishing. It is like a beautiful silver pot that is so thickly tarnished that it looks black. We have to keep polishing until we get back to the silver, which has never in its essential nature been tarnished. Thank you, Ritu. So I think this is also what we were reading earlier that uh, the divine cannot be separate from us. You know, the realized masters, teachers, they cannot be separate from us because the moment we say separate, the moment I say that the divine is somewhere else and I am somewhere else, I am making uh, the divine finite. I am making the divine limited. But that's not true. So when the divine is infinite, like space, many a times, you know, it be related with space or infinity, then it is impossible that I am separate from space. So that's how the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are not separate from our teachers nor from us. They are our true nature. So many a times, you know, when mother, uh, people, People would say, Mother, I can't feel you. And Mother has uh, told us, you know, that in some of the cases that Mother says that this wanting to feel is also a kind of egoism because you are wanting to feel in a certain way. You know, there is a fixed idea. You may not know, but if we look closely, we will see that I want to see the Mother or feel the Mother in a certain way. And that itself is blocking me to feel. And mother says that she is present like air or space is present. So when we are wanting to feel something in a special way, then we are blocking that thing from ourselves because of that curtain that this is how it should look. And many a times, you know, in case of uh, all of us, you know, in relationships, Many a times we have images of this is how this should be and this is how love should be. You know, this is how what I have seen. We may not admit that this is all coming from my conditioning of what I have seen and read in novels and books and movies. But it's all a conditioned mind and that's what I want to see in life. But things don't happen according to that. And then I suffer. And, but in my suffering, if I can realize that I'm wanting things a certain way and that is what is making me suffer, then we can stop our suffering, relax our rules and regulations a little bit. Yeah, And then we see that we already have enough. We really uh, can be grateful for so much that we have, really. So... Uh, Buddha, Bodhisattvas, teachers, divine, they're all our true nature, who we truly are, if only we could see clearly. We think we are ordinary sentient beings. You know, many a time we use this excuse that, oh, that person may have done it, but I can't, you know, see, I am an ordinary being, I am not a genius. So there it's a wrong thought in our head that we are sticking to. We are just limiting ourselves in that cage again. So we think we are ordinary beings, but we are not. This is our tragedy. But the teacher, a genuine realized being or a Lama, Lama means a guru or a master, in, is, a, is not inherently different from us. And so in Buddhist meditations, we absorb either the deity or the Lama or both together into ourselves. So there are many visualizations in Buddhism, many practices, tools, methods, where you are imagining a powerful deity, you know, like Tara or Chenrezig or other deities, and you are uh, 
creating a full image of them in front of yourself and then you are just imagining yourself to be that or absorbing it completely into yourself you know, knowing that yes they are not inherently away from us separate from us thinking that our minds and their minds are mixed together like water with water so if i i am devoted to the mother and mother is enlightened and full of wisdom and all that you know she is the divine mother then when i realize in my visualizations that mother is in me i have the wisdom i have the heart i have the love i have the compassion of the mother you know, in me she is not sitting somewhere out in pondicherry or somewhere separate you know auras may be different of different places but she is right here with all of us yeah so we recognize that there is no distinction and the distinction comes from our side you know because we think that i am limited so the divine is also limited i end here the divine starts somewhere else we think that we are ordinary and they are special but that's part of our delusion and so we have to work away that conceptual at that conceptual distinction we have to know that oh i am limiting you know we have to become grounded in that seeing that i am biased i have a distortion in front of me cleaning and polishing part of delusion and so we have to work away at the conceptual distinction cleaning and polishing you know so we have to keep looking being aware of our distortions and it is like a beautiful silver pot that is so thickly tarnished that it looks black <clears throat> so that's why we say that we don't get our true nature from somewhere outside we just remove the dirt and thick layers of ignorance like a pot has to be polished you know like tak 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 and rumi has this very beautiful quote where he says that if you get irritated at every rub how would you get polished because the task is of polishing and chiseling and you know the so that the crust disappears and the true shine is there so it is like a beautiful silver pot that is so thickly tarnished that it looks black we have to keep polishing this is the sadhana this is the long arduous journey that we are all at you know because the moment the vigilance is gone the tarnish comes back we may have have a glimpse of a shine but then the tarnish is also there just like in our material nature if we don't clean for 2 days 3 days we have the dust back so we have to continue the cleansing we have to keep polishing until we get back to the silver which has never in its essential nature been tarnished and that is why all of us no matter how many sins we may have committed no many how many murders we may have done our true nature is never never tarnished it's only a layer that comes on it which we if we work to remove it can get removed and we get in touch with the true nature and that's why there is hope for everyone yes shilpi okay i thought you were sharing something yeah anything anyone wants to add on so i'm just taking up uh, the next one in continuation however much outer guck there might be around it if we diligently clean the pot then it will shine this silver pot was there all the time it doesn't go away and come back when we clean it it is always there but we don't recognize it all we see is the black covering whereas the great maha bodhi satvas and the lamas the true genuinely realized lamas are very much in contact with their silver base so this is the difference this is why sadhana or effort continuous effort is required because we lose touch we forget so to continue to come back to that silver base is the effort that's the perseverance they do not have that tarnish the way we do because they have already done the work necessary to polish it up and 
maintain its innate shine but their essential nature is the same as ours so here is the oneness that is that makes us one that all of us all of us have as essential nature this silver base and that silver base is one that's where the oneness is that's where the unity is that we are all one yet diverse diverse in the ways it manifests itself it shows itself up but the core is the same and the qualities of core are love wisdom intelligence kindness compassion oneness all these are qualities of that core so this is important to remember you know, that all of us have that silver base. We have to just make that effort. The perfect Buddha's source of happiness and ultimate peace exist through having accomplished the sacred dharma. And that in turn depends on knowing how to practice it. This practice of the Bodhisattvas I shall now, I shall therefore now explain. So I think this is just uh, taken up, a verse taken up. And then we have the, I think the end of introduction here. The Buddhas like Shakyamuni Buddha on a relative level had to strive for countless eons to clear away the tarnish and come back to the true metal. How did they do that? How did all the Buddhas of the universe become Buddhas? They became Buddhas by actually practicing the Dharma. You know, we see the crispness and clarity, and this is Jatsunma Tenzing Palmo's words, you know, with which she makes it so easy and really, I, I mean, you know, we can relate with what she is sharing here. They became Buddhas by actually practicing the Dharma. It is important that we practice and take it to heart rather than merely read about it. This is why this text is so important. It is not high philosophy that we need to go away and think about. It is all up there somewhere in the sky, the high philosophy. It is absolutely down to earth, which we can all use all day with whomever we meet. In fact, only by meeting people can be truly practiced. So in all our day-to-day -day interactions, you know, that's where we truly know genuinely how far we have gone and how much is we are lacking, what are the weak points, what are the points which I have overcome, which are the points which keep coming back again and again, the triggers, you know, all of that. So it's only in the battlefield that we really uh, can use all this practice otherwise there is no use of the practice where will i practice there has to be a battlefield where i practice yeah any last comments anyone More than new learning, there's a lot of unlearning to be done. I think that's the sense that I get each time in these study circles that, I mean, some things that we've taken to be so intrinsic and true and they aren't. So, I mean, as I get into my 40s more and more, if anybody asks me, is there anything to learn? I, the, the answer is that there's a lot of unlearning that needs to be done really. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I think this tarnish would also be a reflection of what you were sharing that all the coverings of all the conditionings and all that we have learned, it has to be polished, removed. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe taking a last moment in case of no reflection, just to share the merit and also 
sending out. May everyone be really peaceful and genuinely progressive and content. May all of us have peace at heart and joy and progress in life. Okay, so thank you everyone. Thank you for staying till the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.